All right, we're back for another week of the Penn State Blitz. I'm Greg Pickle, joined by special guest Dustin Hawkinsmith of Penn Live. This week, we have a lot of Penn State news to get to. The boys are back in town. Upwards of 70 Penn State players are back on campus and start at voluntary workouts this week. We'll discuss what that means before getting into highlights from a pair of media conference calls with players this week. Running back Noah Kane, linebacker Micah Parsons talked about their experiences this offseason and also what it means to be back on campus. And also to know that college classes will start at University Park in person later in August. Finally, we'll move on to where we think the thing stand in terms of a college football season actually being played and if it is whether or not it'll start on time in 2020 and we'll close with the listener mailbag (music) dustin it's been quite some time since we've done a podcast together sir how are you I'm good. I was just thinking about this. Typically, before all this happened, we were together for two plus hours every week talking Penn State football. We haven't had that since March, I think. So the world demanded it. And here I am. Yes. Well, thank you for joining us and let's get to it. So Penn State back on campus, not the whole team at this point. They allowed up to 75 players to come back from what sounds of it. They didn't hit that full 75 for any number of reasons. Uh, So we're going to call it upwards of 70 at this point. We know linebacker Micah Parsons, who we'll talk about in a bit, is returning next week. He wanted to stay home and spend Father's Day, the week of Father's Day with his son and his father. Running back Noah Kane, meanwhile, arrived this week. So he's in his quarantine week and can work out next week. But, Dustin, we also do know that some guys, Michael Mennett being among them, some others that we saw um, from the Lions 247 video that our friend Mark Brennan put together, that there are a number of guys in town and working out. Uh, They went through testing last Monday, so the ones that were healthy and clear were able to test uh, in a physical sense this past Monday, and obviously they're working all out with Dwight Galt and his staff. I guess my first curiosity for you, Dustin, is how many guys do you think, let's just call it 70 to ballpark it, how many of them do you think are even within, let's call it 80% of where Galt would usually have them at this point in time? Oh, that's a fascinating question, isn't it? And I think Micah Parsons kind of addressed this. He was trying to get in in condition on his own, so he didn't die when he got in Dwight Galt's hands. And typically, you're going to be doing that, what, over the summer maybe and into the fall. And so it's a strange time, and it's not going to be a lot of time by the time all these guys get on campus where they can get in the condition that Dwight Galt wants them in. But the good thing, I guess, of it is, is that it's a level playing field pretty much across the nation. So this is going to be something that every program is trying to wrap their heads around. Uh, as far as I, I got to think it's less than half who are 80% of what Dwight Galt wants them. They, they might've been doing this stuff in good faith, but there's no way that they could have been uh, pushed uh, or tested the way that Dwight Galt would have in the winter and spring. Yeah, there's no question about it. So keep in mind the coaches cannot be with these guys yet. We'll talk a little bit later about when they can be back around uh, their players for the first time since the middle of March. But as for now, like we said, we know, uh, you know, a good portion of the roster's back, not all of it. We assume most of it, if not all of it, will be back by the start of next week. They're going in phases. Phase one is already there. Phase two arrives next week. Again, they'll start that week of quarantine and get tested and do all that stuff and then be able to work out. So with by the end of June, certainly uh, we would expect that all of Penn State's roster uh, scholarship and non-scholarship will be back in town. They're working out in groups of anywhere from 10 to 12 to 16 members trying to keep it as uh, confined as possible. They're picking up their meals. Uh, We know at one point the guys were staying in a hotel. That's what a couple of players, Keaton Ellis and Jahan Dotson, said last week. We don't know if they've been able to go back to their apartment off-campus housing, uh, campus dorms. We don't know exactly how that works. Penn State has also said it's not ready to uh, disclose whether or not any players tested positive. There's a lot of uh, wrangling, I guess you could say, about whether that's okay to do or not. So uh, that's kind of what we know at this point, Dustin. And I guess above all else, um, we know the guys were trying their best to work out uh, as they could at home. As you note, um, most of them won't be able to do so in a way that Dwight Galt and his staff can, of course. But at least it feels like a dose of normalcy to have these guys back on campus. It, it does. And I think just a, do, a dose of optimism too, you know, it looks like signs are pointed uh, towards the 2020 season happening in some form or another, but I, I find it fascinating how every interview player, coach, or otherwise re- seems to reveal some new piece of information 
about what these guys are going through. And then even the, the video that Penn State put out, I know Mark Brennan put out a good video of, of these guys walking into the facility, but the video that Penn State put out just shows the number of precautions that are happening behind the scenes, temperature check, check sanitation, you know, all, all this stuff. Um, so, you know, Noah Kane was talking about, you know, the season wasn't guaranteed to them. So it reveals, I think, how little we probably know about what, you know, the home opener is going to look like, what the season's going to look like. There's just no way of knowing. I'm not sure where Penn State is on these discussions, too. There's just so much to figure out and so many needles to thread, so to speak. But we are getting little elements at a time, including James Franklin talking about that the season's not going to look and feel the way it usually does. And it seems like it's obvious. But it kind of gets your gets the wheels going in your head about okay, so what is it going to look like then? I'm not sure anybody really has the answer for that. No, we'll get into that a little bit in third down of this week's Penn Live Penn State Blitz. But let's move on to second down. Noah Kane and Micah Parsons, as we mentioned, spoke to the media this week. Dustin, I guess you know we've talked a lot about the effect that the coronavirus can have on somebody, and some people um, get it and they don't even have symptoms. They don't know they have it unless they get some kind of antibody test where they have some reason to get tested. Some people get it and they lose their sense of taste and smell. Some people get it and have much worse symptoms than that, need to be hospitalized and maybe placed on a ventilator and so on and so forth. And you hear about these kind of stories. You know, we were able to talk to uh, Lloyd Hill, the former Steel High, and a couple other places great about his experiences with it a few months back. Uh, you read things on, you know, here, there, and everywhere. But I thought Noah Kane's perspective uh, really kind of drove home why there's so much uncertainty about what college uh, classes will look like in 2020, what college football will look like in 2020, what anything will look like in 2020. For those that didn't get to see the story, he had four family members test positive for the coronavirus. And he said some days, you know, he didn't know if some of them would make it through uh, the virus. Now, the good news is he says all are feeling better now, but he wasn't able to spend the shutdown break at home in Louisiana. He was bouncing between Texas and Arizona, uh, where he was working out and living with some some folks close to him. So uh, that was a pretty... Um, um, straightforward admission from Noah Kane, maybe uh, a sign that, you know, again, this can impact anyone. And I guess another thing, too, not to get too far off the rails, but it's just a reminder that when these guys have a bad game or when they fumble, you just never know what's going on uh, in their personal lives. This obviously is an extreme example of that, but it's always good to keep in mind, Dustin. I just thought that was a very um, straightforward uh, admission from him of just about what you know, his personal experiences have been like, and it helped shape this conversation of, you know, people don't know what's next because you don't know what's around the corner with your own family and friends, let alone the 100,000 people that maybe uh, one day, probably not this year, but one day could fill Beaver Stadium again. I think there's a lot of people out there, Greg, who don't have a personal experience with COVID-19, who haven't watched it or witnessed it or had somebody go in the hospital because of it. So it very, it very much remains kind of an uh, invisible thing for a lot of people. And so I thought Noah Cain really o talking openly about that was refreshing. And I thought it was important to help people make the connection, as you mentioned too, just about athletes as human beings. They don't always get treated as, as such. They're, they're viewed as a helmet or, you know, uh, somebody who doesn't necessarily have feelings and that kind of thing. So I, I thought it was nice to hear that um, and, and kind of lay witness to what he has been going through himself and the, I guess the risk that he's he's very um, open about confronting to be on campus right now in the first place. Yeah, no question about it. Said it was a difficult decision to come back, but based on where he was in Arizona and Dallas, his family and himself thought that uh, that State College was one of the safer places to be in the kind of controlled area of what the football program is doing. So that's why he decided to come back uh, on the football field. Dustin quickly, uh, he mentioned he was up to 223, 225 pounds. He's still listed on Penn State's roster as 206, which you know, just the latest sign to not take the, the list at weights as gospel. Um, but he seems to feel like uh, he was pretty direct about he feels like he can play just as well as he did, if not better, uh, with more explosion at this weight, more of a Saquon Barkley-like weight than the one he played at a year ago. Yeah, and I think for his running style, um, not the 206 pounds uh, might not be enough, but for the way that he wants to run physically and finish runs and, and, and embrace the 
uh, the physicality of the position. I think 220 plus is good for him. And I don't think it takes away um, anything quickness wise or speed wise or anything like that. I, I think that's a good, healthy weight for him. Probably where we should probably expect him to be maybe for the rest of his career. Uh, it's going to, it's going to suit him. Well, Penn state has a proven track record of uh, now of, developing running backs and, and their bodies more specifically, you know, Saquon Barkley with that thick lower half, you saw Miles Sanders develop that too. And he didn't arrive looking like that. So I think, um, you know, the idea of working in the weight room towards a goal and towards um, a body that you want 220 sounds really good for Noah Kane. It certainly does. Moving on to Micah Parsons. It was interesting to hear him talk about having fun and not putting pressure on himself and just having uh uh, the best experience he can by playing to the best of his abilities game in and game out. That was great, but I was more interested by the comments he made about the two linebacker battles that are going on around him. Jan Johnson and Cam Brown, of course, uh, now graduated uh, former members of the Penn State football program. Then that leaves Ellis Brooks and Jesse Lucetta to battle for Johnson's inside job. And then at Sam linebacker, you have Brandon Smith and Lance Dixon, two extremely talented former five-star classmates who will go head to head for that job. I think most would give Brandon Smith the early nod because he played more last year than Lance Dixon did, but I won't rule out Lance Dixon just because of that. But, you know, when Micah talked about how competitive that room is going to be, I think Penn State needs it because they've had times where their linebacker play has been good, not great. I think Jan Johnson was an underrated member of that defense, but there was a reason at times Penn State went to a two linebacker, four two five, and played most of that because Jan was just a little bit limited in some of the things he could do in the pass game. So they now have guys who have, especially with Smith and Dixon, speed, a size, and Cam Brown had that too, but uh, it's one of the more interesting. There's a lot of position battles on this team that you could pick as your favorite. I, I think this one is certainly uh, ranks among them in terms of who's going to start against or uh, beside Micah Parsons rather, and who's going to come in against who and when. So I think athletically, this is really the year where that the linebacker group goes up quite a bit. The the way that they recruited over the past few cycles, they, including getting another five star in 2020 in Curtis Jacobs you're starting to see that play out on the field now. So nothing against Jan Johnson or Brandon Smith before him, but the athleticism just across the board when you go one through six at the linebackers, I think goes up exponentially over the past two or three years. You're seeing that now. Um, but at the same time, you know, there, there are going to be winners and losers in these competitions. But I think from a fan perspective, there aren't really any losers because you see how they go six deep. And I think you might include Charlie Catcher's name in there as maybe a key reserve. Um, as well, you're, you're, you're probably going to have, you know, Brandon Smith and maybe Ellis Brooks win those jobs, but Jesse Lucetta and, uh, and Lance Dixon are going to be more than capable of playing quality snaps. And I think that that'll be an interesting part of it too, where it's not like starter and, or nothing, they're going to rotate guys in and they, it could be a pretty tight rotation considering how deep they go. All right. This is the Penn Live Penn State Blitz podcast. If you're f listening to the audio version, of course, you can find us on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your audio. Don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe. Leave some feedback. Let us know if you've enjoyed Dustin and Joe sitting in. If you don't want Bob to come back, that's okay too. Just let us know. <laughs> um, the video version of the Penn Live Penn State Blitz and all of our archive footage from and around Beaver Stadium on the road and everywhere the Nittany Lions go can be found at youtube.com slash all Penn State. All right, Dustin, third down. We're going to try and uh, look into a crystal ball here and predict things that are very difficult to predict. But what do we know at this moment about an on-time season? Hope continues to abound that that's going to be the case. However, Penn State's telling us earlier this week that, um, you know, they think it's still too early for things like how many fans will be on and able to come in and things like that. So um, to me, the first date to watch for, uh, and again, let's just run down this offseason plan quick. So for teams like Penn State, it was just approved this week by the NCAA. Teams who start on September 5, like Penn State, is uh, scheduled to against Kent State. They can have eight hours a week of conditioning, weight training, and film review with the coaching staff starting July 13th through 23rd. Then for the first time, starting July 24th through August 6th, they're going to allow some walkthrough action. No helmets, no pads, but... The coaches can be on the field and try and replace some of what they lost in spring ball, albeit while losing the competitive nature of things. That is late June, early August. And then August 7th, all teams are slated to start camp if they are able to do so. So a timeline is in place. However, um, you know, uh, to me, Dustin, the thing to watch for now 
these timelines are great. If teams stay on them, that's great. We're going to keep hearing about positive tests as teams go back to campus. DeMath tells you there almost has to be. So I don't know if it's a reason to panic every single time, uh, you know, some guys test positive, be it at Penn State. Again, they have not said whether anybody has tested positive or not or elsewhere. But to me, the thing to watch for here is June 1 was supposed to be the day television networks and the NCAA and its conference partners announced when games would play kickoff times. We usually have a handful of them by now. We don't have any. And to me, once those start rolling in, that'll be the first time you can feel comfortable about how this season is going to play out. Agree or disagree? Oh, I agree with that. I also I feel pretty optimistic that the season will play out. But as you mentioned, and a lot of people are curious about this, I think for Penn State to say that they don't quite know yet what the fan experience is going to be like, how many people are going to be allowed in stadiums. How is that going to vary from one location to the next? Because it very well could as different schools operate under different state and local government guidelines uh, and that kind of thing. So there's still a lot of uh, plenty of layers to peel back, including the one that you mentioned now, where I think most sports leagues are confronting the what to do with the positive testing. You know, you had what, five or six Cowboys and some te- Houston Texans players test positive. Okay, what are the, what's the NFL going to do with that? Because you're going to have to confront that reality at some point or another. The odds suggest that one or more Penn State players is going to test positive at some point. What what do you do with them? Are they quarantined away from the team? So there's a lot of stuff to figure out, a lot of hoops to jump through. And to me, it just kind of comes down to the shades of gray. Are, to what extent are you playing this season – to fulfill TV obligations, to get these games on TV. How, how much fan experience is going is there going to be? And I think there's going to be some, some cases where there's not going to be much. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Keep in mind, too, that Penn State student season ticket sales are usually uh, completed this re- week, wrapped up by the end of June. No clue when that's going to happen. Not the slightest idea of if there's fans allowed in, will it be 35,000, 40,000, 20,000? You know, who knows? Um, Similarly, don't know how that selection process would work. You know, would uh, there be a random lottery? How long would you have to decide uh, if you're going to use your tickets or not before your spot, uh, if you will, goes back into the drawing? So there's just so many things to figure out here. So many moving pieces. And I understand that these things take time and that they have to consult the latest information and that I'm convinced we'll have forfeits this year. I think that's going to be a a thing that happens. Teams show up, guys all of a sudden start testing positive. You might not have enough players to safely play, so you forfeit, you know. But uh, the clock is ticking, right? So I'm going to have to look because I'm not good at remembering things. But it's June 18 right now. Um, You know, in a month's time, Dustin, If there's not a strong plan in place, you just have to wonder when that strong plan is going to come. Because, you know, again, at some point you have to start being able to make contingencies, especially these schools. And it's almost all of them. But even the the, even more so the smaller schools that rely on these non-conference games to really prop up their athletic budget. You know, if if for some reason they're not going to play non-conference games and just play Big Ten games, it's going to cause a lot of schools a lot of heartache. Penn State obviously would lose some money for, you know, if that was the case as well. But I think within a month's time, we'll have a much better feel for things right now. It seems like a lot of people are throwing a lot of things at the wall and hoping and really uh, hoping against all hope that something sticks and kind of becomes a eureka moment to make all this fit together. Yeah, I don't know if the uh, eureka moment really happens. You know, I I think everything seems to be gradual and intermittent. Uh, This isn't apples to apples, but I was on a uh, PIAA, the high school governing body call earlier this week. And Bob Lombardi, the executive um, director of the the PIAA, basically said – it was time to do to take some steps. Standing on the sidelines and just waiting for the perfect moment wasn't the right way to go either. So I, I think taking these steps to at least, you know, first things first is getting players to a place where it's safe and healthy and they're able to be in good enough condition that they can compete. Right. You know, the, the, the logistics of the season opener don't really matter if you can't get to that place. So it, it, it really seems like and I, I don't know what other choice any of these places have that let's get that piece going and then we're going to keep figuring things out as we go. It is a tight timeline between now and late August, early September to, to really be um, deciding on on what the season looks like, but you have to take some steps and and they're taking them now. And then based on what they learn from their players being around each other, you know, I think maybe some of the next steps uh, are, are um, 
kind of based off that. Yeah, there's no question about it. And, uh, you know, we see the NBA going into a bubble. College football can't do that. I, I don't know if that's going to work. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. Time will tell. But, you know, to have sports in 2020, there's going to be so many uh, precautions and things that have to be made that I could almost see it changing on a, uh, excuse me, a weekly basis almost. You know, I think you're going to have to be okay with being selected to attend a game only to find out that, hey, we have to reduce capacity or, you know, hey, I got to the game and, and such and such Penn State or somebody else didn't have enough healthy players. So we're not going to be able to. I, I just there's going to be a lot of interesting things that go on that are out of, uh, you know, out of people's control. And you're just going to have to learn to uh, live with some of these things uh, until next year, I believe. So we'll see how things play out. All right. Let's get into the listener mailbag to wrap this up. Dustin. A lot of hand wringing going on in Penn State circles, not even so much about whether the season will be played. I think a lot of people are like us and are just kind of waiting for some kind of shoe to drop. But Penn State recruiting is something that a lot of people are concerned about. Where do you stand on that topic? Boy, you could you could play this game every recruiting cycle, right? You Where really it, it gets you really good. Yeah, it, it gets hot. It gets cold. So obviously the cold start. Um, one or two of the prospects in this class definitely said that the coaching turnover played a part in that slow start. And I, did, I do believe the coaching turnover coupled with the NCAA dead period feeds into what you might want to call a dry spell now. You know, if you're going to recruit uh, elite tight ends from the West Coast, for example, and they have no choice to come to campus – it's going to be really hard to get to the finish line with that player, much harder than than more conventional years. So th- those guys tend to, you know, and then and they did. They went back. They reverted to the schools that they knew a little bit better. They were intrigued by Penn State. They liked Penn State. They included them in their list of final schools. But how is Penn State going to get over the top under these conditions? I think what I would say is the hope would be as practices begin and whenever players and prospects can make visits uh, when the season begins and you're starting to see evidence of what these new coaches can do and who they are, what the offense looks like, maybe you start answering questions and maybe that's a time where momentum can pick back up again. Yeah. I think I'm right there with you. I mean, to panic, uh, I you know, there's if you think it's going to be the you know, I, we get a lot of feedback from fans who say, well, this is going to be the year of the decommitment. And I know Bud Elliott did a piece for 247 Sports recently about that. And if you believe that, then there's no reason to worry about where Penn State stands right now, because there's going to be plenty of guys back on the market this fall and this winter ahead of signing day. So we'll see. Uh, not a good start. They're losing too many guys. But when you bring four new coaches in and then they can't come to campus to, to see those coaches or the coaches can't go on the road to see those players, I just I don't know what you're going to There's nothing you can do about it. You just got to live with it, accept it, try the best you can to mitigate the losses and hope that when things reopen again, you have an opportunity to put yourself in a better position than you are right now. All right, Dustin, last question for you. Looking ahead to um, this walkthrough stuff and the start of summer camp at some point. Give me the one player that people aren't talking about enough that they should be talking about more. One player. So, uh, man, I could, can I give you several names for that one player? Is that, is that against the rules? That's against the rules. Yes. I know for me, this isn't a prominent guy. He might not factor in the starting lineup, but Caden Wallace is an interesting player to me. You know, at 6'5", 330 plus, you sort of knew that he had the makings and certainly the, the unique physical makeup uh, to think that he can be a really good player. Talking to Landon Tangwall a few weeks ago, he was he's kind of working off the assumption that Caden Wallace is going to leave early for the NFL. So that got the wheels turning for me. It's like, okay, well, he looks the part. I think there's a, a, a certain sentiment behind the scenes that this kid is going to be really, really good. And maybe we'll start to see him in a rotational a reserve capacity um, this year. I, I think, you know, the, the cornerbacks room, I, I, I think people have acknowledged that this this depth chart is really good. But there are some really vibrant young players at that cornerback spot. Uh, Donovan Johnson, by the way, probably fits this bill that, you know, he was hurt last year and, and people are maybe down on him or, or haven't talked about him very much. And he's penciled in as a starter on the spring depth chart. There's a couple names on, on that depth chart that could qualify, but Donovan Johnson for sure. Yeah, no question about it. I think that he's a perfect candidate for this. I think that Marquise Wilson's a guy who maybe uh, was a little bit overshadowed by 
year, even though he had the good Cotton Bowl. And he is someone who, whether he becomes a starter or not, I think will be a major impact guy on this team and somebody who has a nose for the football. Penn State secondary badly needs that. And he's someone I think could take a major step forward. All right, that's it for this week's edition of the Penn State Blitz. Bob Flanders would now segue to a Belmont Stakes prediction, so I'll give it for him. I'm against his the law. I like to have it to win. Dustin Hawkins-Smith, thank you for joining us. And until next time, uh, the Penn Live Penn State Blitz wraps up here.